Kanga Kamara. That is by the stones in Gnomish, otherwise known as Gnim. Nim utilizes an adapted version of the Dwarven Deathic alphabet, and Gnomish writings have literature that covers a staggering variety of topics. Nim has a simple structure and fluid tones. Most gnomes have a truly daunting vocabulary, with extremely fine degrees of distinction in it. Their language is thus ideal for academic, artistic, and engineering pursuits, and is widely used in academic circles, even among other races. Many sages of many races consider Nim to be the scholar's language much as Draconic is a great language for the arcane arts. How's it going everybody? You're back with AJ. This is the Mighty Glue Stick and we're covering the gnomes today. Congratulations to all of you who guessed on my little clue from the last video. The gnome, uh, not everybody's favourite race. Hopefully I can change some perspectives with today's uh, rather long video. This, I've got a script which will be available to my Patreon subscribers. Uh, anyone who um, donates a dollar or more per month can uh, check out any of the uh, material which I've made exclusive to them. The gnome appeared as a player character race in the original player's handbook in 1978. The gnome also appeared in the original monster manual in 1977 and a new gnomish race, the deep gnome or the Sverf Neblin, was presented as a character race in the original Unearthed Arcana in 1985. Another gnome subrace, the Tinker Gnome, was presented in the Dragonlance Adventures. Gnomes were originally introduced to Dungeons and Dragons as a new alternative to dwarves and elves and halflings. They were developed from mythology from a number of different sources, originally being a bearded short race similar to halflings and dwarves. Uh, the gnome's niche in play was made magical to separate it from the more warrior-like dwarf and the more rogue-like halfling. Gnomes in Dungeons and Dragons have been further divided into various sub-races. As of 3rd edition, they were the Rock Gnomes, which were the standard uh, gnome sub-race of 3rd edition. They live in burrows beneath rolling woodland hills. Friends to animals, Rock Gnomes have a racial ability that allows them to speak with burrowing animals. Tinker Gnomes are uh, the common gnomes of the Dragonlance campaign setting. In that fictional universe, they dwell in the uh, Mount Nevermind in the world of Kryn. Swift Neblin, or Deep Gnomes, dwell in the city's deep underground. They are more dangerous than the common rock gnome. Forest Gnomes are smaller than rock gnomes. They are shy, secretive folk living deep in woodland areas. River Gnomes are graceful and quick. They live in homes dug in the side of riverbanks that speak with river-dwelling animals in place of burrowing mammals. They are non-magical, but gain a plus one to initiative and are proficient swimmers. Arcane gnomes are city dwellers. They generally keep to a small community within a larger city, and the arcane gnomes are focused on the pursuit of knowledge, making their populace in large part even uh, over-eager inventors or wizards. Chaos gnomes are the most flamboyant gnomes, brightly coloured and rare. They are strongly inclined towards chaos, as their name suggests. Whisper gnomes lack the jovial outlook of the other gnome races. Sly and suspicious, they are creatures of stealth. Ice gnomes dwell in the region of Frostfell in the Eberron campaign setting. Fire gnomes live in Bytopia on the Outer Plains, where they help Flandel Steelskin, the gnomish god of metal and crafting, in his work. Sky gnomes appear in the Creature Crucible Top Ballista PC2 published in 1989. They are cunning engineers living in the flying city of Serain above the world of Mystara. There are elements of all of these original themes present to this day in the modern gnome and as uh, usual we're going to go deep into the lore of the gnomes in the Forgotten Realms as the official setting for this the fifth edition of the world's most popular and enduring role-playing game. In the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, gnomes have been known as the Forgotten Folk. There are three gnomish races, officially, these days. Forest, Rock and Deep Gnome. Rock being the most common and best known of the fifth edition. Rock gnomes are essentially an amalgam of Rock and Tinker Gnome, and there is the option to play the Forest Gnome plus the Elemental Evil Player's Companion presents the Deep Gnome as a player race. We're going to talk about all of them, and hopefully you'll come away, as I said, with a better understanding of the Forgotten People, the rare, often present, but not overly ambitious and typically overlooked gnomes. Gnomes, were base walking speed is 25 feet. They all get plus two to their intelligence score. They have dark vision and can see in dim light within 60 feet, as if it were bright light, and in darkness as if it was dim light, but only in shades of grey. Gnomes have advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws against magic of all kinds, and speak, read, and write common and gnomish, or nim. 
The Gnomish language, which is the Dwarvish script, as I've said, is renowned for its technical treatises and catalogues of knowledge about the natural world. So be sure to include those in dungeons and things like that where wizards have collected such works. The, the Nim language will be prevalent. So what is a gnome? The common gnome, if you will. First of all, there are, species, there are small species of humanoid that were created by divine action and are not the result of elves and dwarves mating long ago, or anything like that. Also, in Forgotten Realms, they have an ancient homeland and an origin that took place in the world of Toril, so they're not actually natives of the Feywild. They, they are certainly well suited to living there as much as they are at home on the Prime Material Plane. Physically, standing between 3 and 4 feet tall, weighing on average 40 pounds, an adult gnome, so that's about just over 18 kilos, an adult gnome is the height and weight of an average 5-year-old human child. However, while the child may even lift, uh, may even weigh a little more than the typical gnome, who are lean, uh, the gnome is much stronger than even the strongest human child, even though human children of extraordinary natural ability have been known to lift up to four times their own weight. That is not the uh, that unusual for an adult gnome who is physically fit, and they would consider carrying their own body weight to be an average or medium load. So a gnome can carry another adult gnome, gnome all day, and even climb or run with that gnome in tow. The same way a human could with a regular pack full of adventuring gear. This also means a gnome can, with some effort, pick up and carry a human who weighs around 150 pounds or 68 kilos with a lot of effort, but they could carry them a short distance, counting as heavily encumbered. And this would be um, if the gnome has a strength attribute of, say, 15 or so. So not that high. So a gnome with a strength of 18 could, if they got a good hold on an adult human, be just as dangerous and able to severely hurt, dismable, disable or maim that human, somewhat like a very angry chimpanzee is capable of pretty much mangling someone. Quite frankly, I would not want to get too close to a gnome that is in a murderous state of mind because they are much stronger than they look. As you can imagine, this is an incongruous prospect for you or I, but would seem normal to people who know what gnomes are capable of. It also means that gnomes are very high, they have a very high strength to mass ratio, and that they are very probably wiry and tough as a coffin nail. Similar to an expert rock climber, they would have no problem scaling walls, climbing trees, leaping over ditches and sprinting further than your average human adult without tiring out as fast. So gnomes are tough, and they are stronger than they look. While an adult human could easily pick up and hurl a gnome across a tavern common room, because after all they're the size of a five-year-old, the gnome could just as easily grab a crossbeam, flip around it and launch straight back at that human, taking them full in the face with a flying kick and landing with a tumble maneuver to break the impact. However, being much lighter, the impact is not as bad for them. Similarly, while a gnome is unlikely to best a human in an arm wrestle, they will wipe the floor with a human in a thumb wrestle, where the advantage of leverage is now in their favour, since they usually have hands that are comparative in size to a small adult human. Gnomes have an increased vitality and aptitude for magical ability, increased sensitivity uh, for their senses, and are renowned for their astonishing intellect. Gnomes widely vary in appearance, however they do share similar traits as a species, and yes, I said species, they are not a race, and do not crossbeed with other humanoids. Not as far as I've found, officially at any rate. But your game may allow it, If you, uh, in which case I would say perhaps it would be more likely between halflings or even dwarves. But gnomes are not numerous, and they have strong community bonds, so personally I doubt it would be a thing that happens very often, if at all. Most players are familiar with what is known as the rock gnome, so... I will start by describing them, then the forest gnome, and then the deep gnomes. But first, a word about the legend of the creation of the gnomes by their de deity, Gaal Glittergold. The treatise historical of the dragon tyrants held that gnomes were created in approximately minus 24,500 Dale Reckoning. So 20, close to 24,500 years ago. From gems hidden in caverns beneath a mountain in the land later known as Netheril. Kobolds enslaved the first gnomes and stole the gems that contained yet unborn gnomish souls. This prompted Gaal Glittergold to, to collapse the mountain, killing most of the kobolds, including their leader, Kurtholmuk, and creating the depression known as the Hidden Lake, later as the Shoal of Thirst. 
Gnomish myths held that the gods of the gnome pantheon originated as gems deep within the bowels of the earth that were then exposed to open air. This kind of reminds me of the legend of Stone Monkey. Likewise, these myths held that the gnomes were created when Gal Glitigal discovered similar gems and breathed life into them, which he followed up with a joke, inspiring the race to craftiness and mischief. This story also related that gnomes born of diamonds became the rock gnomes, those forged of emeralds became forest gnomes, and those made of rubies were the ancestors of the deep gnomes. Early in their history, many gnomes were held captive by nations of Netheril and Kalimshan as slaves, though most escaped this cruel fate. Other than those early tales, little is known about the formative history of the gnomes. What has remained true basically for their entire history is that gnomes and kobolds hate each other, each other almost as much as dwarves hate goblins and elves hate orcs. Of course, gnomes hate goblins also. While humans, dwarves, Eladrin and elves all forged empires and waged terrible wars that devastated the land, gnomes did nothing of the sort. Throughout history, they were known as a scattered race of hidden villages, clans and holds, rarely caught up in grand events. The gnomes were sometimes referred to as the Forgotten Folk, and this title is perhaps apt, and few of their race ever graced or troubled the mighty. Instead, remaining characters who faded, for the most part, into the background while others went on to forge mighty legends. For a time, there was an exception to this, um, in the Isle of Lantern. As the number of humans grew and gnomes became further marginalised, younger generations began to question the wisdom of their forebears in taking a deliberately passive role in the world events. This attitude was seemingly encouraged by the appearance of Gond, the god of invention among the... Uh, among the gnomes of Lantern, during the time of Troubles in 1358 DR. As a result, there was a gradual trend uh, in more and more gnomes leaving their reclusive homes to travel the world, and Lantern was a nation dominated by gnomish engineers. Here, the gnomes, as an exception to the rule, were dominant, and it was their culture that dictated the laws of the land. However, the gnomish isle was overwhelmed by a great tsunamis, resulting from the shifting of continents that occurred during the Spell Plague, destroying the small bastion of gnomish ingenuity and culture. This, I should add, is the very... um, It's still very fresh in the culture of the gnomes, and it was a terrible, terrible disaster that is incredibly sad. So absolutely, most gnomes, or particularly rock gnomes, will feel deeply about this and may be motivated personally to reclaim something of the glory of Lantern. But this is more than the knowledge and culture that was lost. It's, It's not about ambition. This lack of ambition is not apathy or even some great far-reaching wisdom. It's just that gnomes value different things than other races. They seek knowledge and beauty and wonder. They don't crave recognition, fame, enormous wealth and power. Nor do they seek their own land. They just want a home, peace, enjoyment, friends, family and fun. At their heart, the culture of most gnomes is neutral good. And as such, this is the most common alignment of individuals particularly amongst rock gnomes. One interesting side note is that um, as a fun quirk of gnomish society is that the hum- other humanoids may find it frustrating. Gnomes generally have little regard for strict time management, appointments, dates, meetings, start or end times, all that fuss. They operate on gnomish time. Um, and that's one reason why they have a, such a sketchy record of their history, but more on that later. Gnomes primarily live in wooded, hilly landscapes, most often underground. And generally speaking, though gnomes enjoy the fresh air a good deal more than your subterranean races such as dwarves or drow, and rarely burrow very deep, spending a great deal of time on the surface, gnomish homes or communities are generally well hidden, making it difficult for unwelcome visitors to find them. Within gnomish ho- houses, were that they're warm and comfortable, akin to the burrows of small animals. So, oddly enough, gnomes are more like hobbits than halflings are, or at least in the way that they would build their homes. Halflings are comfortable in farmhouses, travelling wagons, river boats, and yes, many of them live in gnomish-style hill homes. But gnomes are found widely throughout the world, uh, though really in large numbers. Small communities are most uh, commonly found in the western heartlands, Altagard and along the coastline of the Shining Sea. Other gnomes, notably the Sverf Neblin or Deep Gnomes, are found in the Underdark and even more secretive than other gnomes, maintaining their distance from other races except for dwarves, who they 
basically maintain careful, polite relationships for the purposes of protection and trade. So most gnomes who do live among other races, particularly humans, work as gem cutters, mechanics, sages, teachers, particularly teachers, being highly valued professionals uh, by human employers who know that a single gnome could tutor multiple generations of their children. I mean, think about Yoda from Star Wars, right? And you pretty much nailed it. Small but respected, intelligence, sense of humor, good at magic, occasionally a total badass kung fu goblin, but happy to float around on a flying disc and run a galactic police force, or live as a hermit on a swamp planet for decades. I mean, Yoda was a space gnome, basically. Rock gnomes embody the characteristics of their creator and patron deity, Gal Glittergold, choosing to spend their long lives by fulfilling each day as with as much fun and enjoyment as possible. They possess a natural brownish tint to their skin. The presence or absence of light has little effect upon it. And young rock gnomes possess any of a large number of hair colours that fade to grey or white upon reaching adulthood. So this is um, by the time they're 40 or so. And they, they age at the same rate that humans do. Male gnomes uh, typically keep their beards groomed in a neat manner and most often wear shoes, unlike halflings who rarely ever do. Rock gnomes are loath to perform dreary physical labour if there is some sort of a shorter way to do it with magic or mechanisms or use money to get someone else to do it. They're not lazy, they just don't like boredom. The fact that humans can slog away at a task that some smart thinking could avoid is something that constantly amuses them. Dwarves even more so, but then dwarves are capable of stoic obsession with perfecting craftwork that rock gnomes find entrancing. As for elves, well, the time they take to devote to any task until they reach this sort of level of artistry um, is great when they are showing off the end result, but the time it takes to get to that point is something that gnomes find a little bit spooky, to say the least. Rock gnomes are fond... Uh, they're found commonly in the western heartlands and dalelands um, and the woodlands between the Great Dale and Thesk and gather in small towns, rarely reaching 500 individuals. They consider large cities to be uncomfortable, particularly because of the great amount of demand the big folk have on their skills. Rock gnomes are comfortable deep underground almost as much as on the surface world, possessing skill in ore and gem cutting that surpasses um, that of dwarves. For, particularly for uh, gem cutting and crafting new ores, along with notable skills in toy making and clockwork engineering, which is reflected in the skills that the character class has. Rock gnomes also the, are the finest producers of the new weapons known as guns. If you have them in your game, um, rock gnomes will be the ones that uh, you'd probably be getting them from. Rock gnome homes are burrows, small but clean cave-like cabins, uh, carvings into stone and hillsides, Married gnome couples have rooms for each to use, and though rock gnome children generally sleep together in a single room, uh, rock gnome burrows are constructed by the clan, allowing underground tunnels to conjoin one another for defence and other purposes. These passages are often cobbled with glazed and colourful tiles, forming beautiful patterns, flickering magical light glitters floor, walls and ceilings with brilliantly detailed artistry like fine jewellery, gems and fine metals, grottos with central features like uh, soft fountains, statues, children's playgrounds, sort of jungle gym play areas, and notice boards with adults, uh, lots of places for them to relax, read or chat together with nooks, throw pillows, knitted rugs, and it's all wood, stone, and brick, uh, curved, carved, more akin to the elven style with soft lines mimicking nature, rather than the hard geometry and engineering of the dwarves. Humans entering a gnome home will find that the front door is not very impressive, certainly not as obvious or large as the round doors of Hobbiton, for instance, but the inside of the homes are just as comfortable, even more cluttered with items of interest and beauty with perhaps less room devoted to food. The back door, however, leading into the underground passages and chambers, uh, is more like an impressive front door on a human home, and the deeper one goes, the wider and more bustling the complex becomes, with many burrowing creatures wandering around or sleeping in comfortable spots. And it is a mistake many, many humans make to assume that these animals are tame pets, and gnomes quickly warn a human reaching to scratch uh, behind the ear of a snoozing wild badger, 
<laughs> it's a wild badger. Gnomes don't keep pets as humans do. They don't cage an animal unless it's for its own protection. Also, they tend to work around and with the animal's natural behavior rather than try to train the animal out of doing what comes naturally to it because they can talk to them. Within reason, of course, the animals know well enough not to go digging through uh, holes in walls or they're not allowed to disrupt anything. After all, living among gnomes is extremely beneficial to their survival. Gnomes make good use of cleared and protected human roads, elven treetop paths and dwarven underground roads and river passages, rarely ever bothering to make such things themselves. Not when a game trail can probably get them where they need to go. That's another reason why it's easy to walk through one of their communities without really noticing that you're in a community. It'll just seem like the game trails get particularly well used in a particular area. Forest gnomes take this blending into nature to an extreme degree. They are among the least commonly seen gnomes on Toril. Far shyer than even their deep gnome cousins, rarely growing taller than two and a half feet in height and weighing over 30 pounds. Unlike other gnomes, forest gnomes generally grow their hair long and free feeling neither the need to, nor desire to shave or trim their hair. Substantially, though, males often uh, do take careful care of, of their beards, trimming it to the fine point or curling it into horn-like spikes. Forest gnomes' skin is an earthy colour and looks in many ways like wood, although not as particularly tough. Forest gnome hair is brown or black, though it greys with age and sometimes to a crystal pure white. Uh, like the other gnomes, forest gnomes generally live for centuries, although their life expectancy is a bit longer than the case for either rock or need gnomes. 400 is the average life expectancy of a forest gnome. Forest gnomes are painfully shy creatures. Uh, they neither feel the need nor want to interact with other races, for the most part, and would simply like to be ignored, as they have been for millennia. Unlike deep gnomes, this comes less out of a general mistrust of outsiders and more of an extreme sense of privacy and affinity for the natural world. They just combine with a general ambivalence about things and they outside of their experience. They just, you know, they, they're comfortable among their own kind. They're friendly and particularly lively amongst themselves. Forest gnomes are largely hunter-gatherers. They harvest their food from wild fruits, nuts and berries and supplementing their diet with a little bit of meat. Um, and their villages are usually composed of less than a hundred members who are all generally part of an extended family. One reason most people don't even realise they are walking through a forest gnome settlement is that the entrances and many rooms of the forest gnome house is located inside large living trees. The doors are not in the trunk. The windows are um, in nooks of branches. The Burrows cluster down among the living tree's roots, forming the beams of the gnome's rustic but comfortable dwellings. The homes themselves are usually made of several tiny rooms stacked on top of one another, with trapdoors and ladders connecting them. Each room is about four feet tall, lined with windows to let in the sunlight. And forest gnomes only really become adventurers, usually due to some kind of threat to their home or other need that requires them to leave their reclusive homes. Most gnomes instead are craftsmen or experts of various kinds, and those that do leave take on a variety of different roles. The forest gnomes' love of music makes them excellent if somewhat shy bards. Other forest gnomes uh, become clerics or druids who often play important roles in forest gnome society upon their return. Very few forest gnomes would consider themselves proper warriors, and forest gnome fighters are next to unheard of. On the other hand, most forest gnomes are well suited to the life of a rogue given their small size and stealthy nature. Some forest gnomes also show a propensity for the arcane arts and become, like so many of their kin, illusionists. Because of the historical conflict with other races, forest gnomes often have a defensive training against kobolds, orcs, goblinoids, and reptilian humanoids, which serve as um, good skills to take and are quite often appreciated by other adventurers on their travels. Forest gnomes have a stronger sense of faith than the other uh, gnome subrace, although it's often a very different from the typical gnome, incorporated into it animalistic trans uh, animistic tra traditions and a reverence for the natural world. Priests are often community leaders who help to keep constant villages, uh, distant villages in touch. And when large numbers of forest gnomes gather, priests of various types are usually there to bless the meetings and of all the gnome gods. Uh, the forest gnomes revere Bear Van Wild Wanderer the most, while Rock Gnomes revere Gal Glittergold and Deep Gnomes revere Segojan Earthcaller. Like other gnomes, Forest Gnomes rarely bother to keep meaningful historical records. This is a common theme. 
and anthropologists and historians have postulated that the tiny people may have helped save forests throughout Tyrol from overlogging and other forms of destruction, but there's no concrete proof of these efforts. For the most part, forest names of various villages often mark years by sort of important events for them, but good or bad, that before their community. But these events are really significant and they largely mean nothing to little um, to outsiders. Though they are not completely uncommon, forest gnomes are more often than not uh, found in Aglarond and the Great Dale. Wherever they live, forest gnomes are well hidden and often go unnoticed, sometimes for centuries, by their neighbours. So, deep gnomes, or Sverfneblin in their own language, are serious and suspicious creatures. They survive in the Underdark by maintaining wariness of all others and working hard to keep their underground society secret, for very good reasons. Deep gnomes are wiry and lean, with a body as hard as a slab of rock. Males are completely bald and beardless, while the females sport some hair. Uh, ranging from 3 foot to 3 foot 6, uh, about 107 centimetres or 1 metre 7, in height and weighing between 40 and 45 pounds, or about 20.4 kg. The deep gnomes are small enough to give them a size advantage when battling larger opponents. Deep gnome complexions are sometimes described as gnarled, and like drow and duergar are commonly dark in hue, with most deep gnomes demonstrating brown or grey skin with dark grey eyes, as well as grey hair if female. Uh, deep gnomes do not live quite as long as their kin, with a life expectancy of only 200 to 250 years, still twice as long as a human, and due to this there is a number of... Um, well, there's a number of cultural um, affectations, and deep gnome children are considered to be adults at roughly 20 years of age. One of the largest deep gnome cities in Faerun was the city of Bligdenstone. Uh, until the drow of Menzo Baranzin summoned Bebeliths inside the city on the year of the tankard, the survivors fled to the surface and settled in hundreds within the lands of the north, particularly in Lura. Sverf Neblin also aided in the mining of bloodstones out of the bloodstone mine in Damara, as they know where all of the most valuable deposits are to be found. And more recently, the Sverf Nebulin of this region have opened a college of illusion magic. Most other Sverf Nebulin live isolated in small communities in the Underdark, hidden away from the drow and other Underdark races who terrorise and subjugate them. Uh, deep gnomes have unique traits. They have stone camouflage, which provides them an advantage on dexterity, stealth checks made to hide in rocky terrain. They have full dark, ship, full dark vision out to 120 feet, and they have, um, along with their usual plus two intelligence, they have a plus one to their dexterity score. They speak, read, and write gnomish and undercommon, with uh, common as a third language. The Sverf Neblin dialect is more guttural than that of the surface gnomish, and uh, most Sverf Neblin are only a little, they, well, they're only a little bit fluent in common, unless that they are a typical adventurer who travels to the surface more often than others of their kind, so adventurers typically speak common fluently. Deep Gnome players can select a racial feat called Sverf Neblin Magic. This uh, ability allows them to cast non-detection on themselves at will, without needing any material components. They can also cast each of the following spells once per uh, day with this ability. Blindness, or deafness, blur, and disguise self. They regain the ability to cast these spells when they finish a long rest. So, uh, the Gnomish Pantheon of Gods, also called the Lords of the Golden Hills, consists of the leader, Gal Glittergold, as well as Bear Van Will, uh, Wild Wanderer, Baravar Cloak Shadow, Flandel Steelskin, Gaeldal Iron Hand, Nebulin, Segerjan Earthcaller, and Erdlin. The Glutton, Gelf Dark Hearth, Rill Clever Thrush and Shiana Flaxenstrand, being introduced in a supplementary book, are not considered canon to the Pantheon, although they are included here for completion and because I particularly like them, particularly uh, Gelf Dark Earth, the uh, twin brother of Gal Glittergold. Also, many gnomes commonly revere Gond, or at least many deep and rock gnomes do, uh, although he's not a member of the gnomish Pantheon. There is a lot more information on forest and deep gnomes that I recommend looking through if you have a focused interest on them for your campaign or just the love of knowledge. So I've included some links down below. Uh, that's it for this video on the gnomes. I think I've warbled on quite long enough about them. But there is, as I say, a lot more information, particularly on the deep gnomes. 
um, that you can cover. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'll be back again midweek with another Explores video and every weekend with a Monster Ecology video. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you again soon.